Welcome to Hope Community Podcast. It's great to have you join us today listening online. We pray you'll be impacted by our message this week. Enjoy. That the Lord would bless you, that the Lord would speak. Bless them, get them good. Father, we just thank you for what you're going to say this morning. And we've already been praying, Holy Spirit, let your voice speak so powerfully in this time this morning, God. We pray that each and every person will receive from you in this space, Lord. And at the same time, we bring our heart for you, God. Amen. Amen. Awesome. All right. Are you good? There's a quiet kind of reverence in the house this morning, which is cool. Uh, seventh birthday. I'm, uh, I've got a little word that I want to share today. And uh, for me, I want to speak a little more prophetically than I generally would preach. And uh, I know that straight away there's going to be some people who are kind of like... Um, your response to that might be a little bit like, whoa, whoa, settle down, you know. Um, it's okay. It, we're still going to go to the Word of God. Uh, we're still going to hear what God has to say, as any follower of Jesus uh, would be doing. Uh, but this morning, I want to take those words and I, I really want you to receive them in quite a personal context or just take a posture this morning really in this message, probably more than usual, in saying, Father, uh, what are you speaking to me? And if you have a word in season for me this morning, I'm ready just to take hold of it. And I want you to picture it this morning like um, a seed, that you're ready to receive something in seed and not that everything that I'm throwing out this morning is going to be the seed for everyone in this room, but perhaps this morning you will receive some seed and it'll be something that gets planted in your heart. It'll get tested in your heart that you'll put it before God and then um, if it's from the Lord, that it's going to grow into something from this space. Is that cool? Are you with me? Are we all right with this? Okay, great. Well, we're going to get into the Bible just to make this legal for Baptist meeting. Um, <clears throat> Joshua 6 is where I want you to turn. Um, I'll tell you how I came to Joshua 6. I was praying and I was saying, Father, um, we, we, there was a bit of a plan on, how, on what was going to roll out after last Sunday's message. And I was just put that before God and I said, well, God, well, um, what do you really want to speak into this space this Sunday. And uh, in context of our seventh birthday, I thought this was funny because uh, I felt like Holy Spirit led me to this passage in Joshua 7, which is the story of the Israelites marching around the walls. And anyone who knows that story knows that that story actually has a number of sevens in the story Um, even though it's in Joshua 6. If it was in Joshua 7, it just would have been amazing. Um, But anyway, the Lord knows best. So we're in Joshua 6. Maybe it's because you have to go and read Joshua 7 yourself. Um, So in the Bible, the number 7 actually represents a few things. It probably most often the number 7 represents completion. Um, But it also represents, uh, what's quite obvious to us, it represents rest and Sabbath. And um, I I think completion, rest and Sabbath, they are all really great words. They're words that I like, so I like the number seven. Uh, If you're like me, when it comes to completion, it's always good to see something completed and then to be able to sit back and admire your handiwork. Right Now, I have a friend that uh, he has a business that makes water tanks. And if I, if I go anywhere with this friend, we're constantly always looking out the window for water tanks, right? There's this sense of achievement whenever one of his water tanks is found. Uh, for me, my background before pastoral ministry is uh, in the electrical field. And uh, I worked for Energex for a number of years and I worked on 
um, all the power lines that you see around and stuff like that. And so um, at times I can drive around in certain places and say, well, I put that up and I fixed that and I did this and I did that. If anyone knows a chippy, they are constantly just driving around and, you know, they'll take a specific way to get somewhere so they can just drive past something and be like, yeah, I built that. <laughs> but there is this, is anyone with me on that? Are there any wives or partners who are just like, yes, have one of them? Um, There is this great sense of achievement that we get from completion. And of course, when we look at creation and the creation story, we see that the Father created, created, created for six days. And on the seventh, he rested. And he got to look at everything and have this opportunity to say, it is good. And um, I feel like this is just the first word that God was really putting on my heart this morning is that um, this year ahead, the eighth year can be a year of rest and completion for you. And it may seem like the two things don't really work together, but here's what I want you to know is that our understanding of rest is generally very different to God's understanding of rest. Uh, For most of us, our understanding of rest would be lying on the couch for a long period of time, binging on Netflix, right? And some people are thinking, hey, that's what I'm doing this afternoon. It's going to be great. Um, the Father's idea of rest is active participation in His presence. Um, So it's a moving, it's a working. It's engaging your heart more than your hands. Engaging your heart more than your hands. Um, One way to see it is it's the end of my activity and it's the beginning of God's activity. So in a place of rest, we like to think of it as a static place where nothing is actually happening. But rest in the kingdom is a dynamic place. It's a moving place where things are happening. Rest in the Father's presence is a place where something is always happening. God is building intimacy with Him. God is growing our character. God is bringing us rest and refreshment. He's restoring our soul. The psalmist says in Psalm 23 that He leads me by still waters. In that place, we're in a place of rest where we are receiving His refreshing. It's a place that is a place of peace and it's outside of chaos. When we stand in the Father's presence and rest, there are always things that are actually taking place. And for some people here, the Word of God for you for this year ahead is that there is a season of rest that is coming. And it's more about what you're receiving than what you're giving out in this season. Just like a tree might have a season where it's growing and it's putting down roots and it's establishing itself as a healthy tree prior to the season where fruit just pops out and it gets covered in fruit. There'll be a season for you of just resting in God. And your job in that space is to recognise this is a place of rest in the Father. Father, what are you doing in this space? Because I want to be on board with what you're doing. Because we can see it as I'm just going to sit here and do nothing. Or we can see it as I am resting, but I want to partner with you in this space and receive what you're doing. Are you growing my character? Are you calling me deeper? Are you calling me to release something? Are you bringing healing in this season? Show me what you're doing so I can actively participate in this from a place of rest. Are you with me? So the difference is, the key difference between our understanding of rest and the Father's is productivity. Our understanding of rest is generally very unproductive. The Father's idea of rest is still productive. He is always at work. He is always doing something. Now, Joshua 6, we are going to read this. And um, it's part of a huge story. It's part of the story of God um, in this massive narrative. But here where we jump in into this space, we have just seen um, that God has brought Israel out of slavery in Egypt. He brought them into the desert. Of course, he did that through um, amazing miracles. He brings them into the desert where they wander for 40 years. He leads them finally to cross 
the Jordan River. They get a new leader. They transfer from Moses to Joshua and it's Joshua's job to lead the Israelites into the promised land. Now they cross through the Jordan River on dry land, a miracle that we've seen happen before in the Red Sea. Um, And they step into this land, which God has declared to them is a promised land. He, He gave it to Abraham years and years before. And here they are for the first time standing on, on the other side of the river and they're in the promised land. And the first thing that is front of, in front of them is this city of Jericho. And it's interesting that the Father has led them into the promised land, but the promised land actually needs to be taken by them for them to be able to possess it. And I think it's interesting that this is the way that it happened in this context, because so often God gives us things in life and they need to be taken by us for us to be able to possess them. And sometimes we just expect, well, if the Father's giving it to me, it's going to land in my lap. And maybe this is a word for someone today, is that God wants to give you something, but you have to actually take it. He wants you to possess it, but there's going to be some battles. It's going to take you really pressing in Him um, to finding out how you will take it, how you will receive it, but He has it for you to give. And so here they are and they're standing there and the city of Jericho is before them. Now the city of Jericho is surrounded by a massive wall. This is a fortress, this place. They put these walls around their city so they could keep themselves safe from armies. And this wall was an impressive wall. All right, now we're going to read from Joshua 6, starting at the very beginning. He says, Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city at once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests, seven, carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, March around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. And so here's something that I felt that God wanted me to highlight is that God's ways are not our ways. And often we come in faith to the Father And yet we still live the way that we would live, the way that we would do things. Um, In this context, marching around a city was completely crazy, right? So can you imagine being Joshua the leader and God tells him, this is how you're going to take this city. I want you to tell your army that they're going to start just marching around the city and when they shout, the walls are going to come down. And you'd be thinking, Lord, is, is there no other way of doing this? Please, I got to go to. You got to go to like your army general, right? Um, this guy, he's one of those. Guys, like he likes to kill people, right? That's why he has that job. And you got to say, hey, we're not we're not going to kill people um, in a typical battle. We're just going to march around the walls, right? Anyway, Joshua does this. But what would usually happen in that context would, is they would come to these cities with these walls and they would they would have different ways of getting in. Sometimes they would tunnel under the walls. Um, sometimes they would try and break down the doors and get in through the doors and things like that. Sometimes they would literally build these huge dirt ramps. So they would, they would get earth and they would build a dirt ramp from, from way, way back and they would build this ramp leading all the way up to the top of the wall and they could climb over the wall like that. There were all these different ways they would get in. And God says, no, you guys are just going to march around the walls, right? This is what I want you to do. But the Father's ways are not our ways. In Isaiah 55, he says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways, are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So this is what I want you to hear. As a follower of Jesus, life is no longer about common sense, it's about kingdom sense. 
What now makes sense in the kingdom of God? The only way that you know that is by opening the Scriptures and in particular, seeing how Jesus... God manifest on earth, lived His life. If you wanna know what the kingdom looks like, then you look at that. Father, what happens when a sick person is sitting across from me? Well, just look, have a look in the Scriptures and see what I did and do what I did, right? Father, what do I do when it seems like the storms are raging? Open your Bible, have a look in there. It's all there for you, right? The Father wants us to move from common sense into kingdom sense. And what that actually means for us is that we have to find out how God wants us to live in the kingdom, Now, here's the encouragement for you is that there is so much joy to be found in this space. When you can move from common sense to kingdom sense, when you take something and you put it before God and you hear His voice speak into your situation and you know, now I know how to move forward with this and you obey and you do it, you get to sit back and you get this incredible joy in knowing I finally have done something the Lord's way. And you know what? It amps you up and you think, this is good. I want to do it that way again. And the next time you're confronted with a situation where you think, I know what common sense is, but Father, let me see what happens in this space in the kingdom. You're going to be quick to jump to that as your first option. Are you with me? Okay. So they march around the city for six days. Okay, I'm cutting the story a bit short just for the sake of saving some reading time. Um, Jump down to verse 15 with me. And it says, On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and they marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, Shout, for the Lord has given you this city. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, And at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in and they took the city. Now, let me show you in a bit more detail um, what this actually looks like. I've got an image of the wall for you. This is the type of wall that was around Jericho. And um, what we know of these walls is that underneath that bottom retaining wall, there would have been a wall built in the ground Usually it would have been like three or four metres. That would try and stop armies from tunnelling under the wall. Then you've got the retaining wall and then you've got the wall on top of that. Then there was usually this area in between where there was a second wall. Um, Now this was, you can see that this was fairly daunting um, to any army that was trying to come and attack. They would be thinking, well, how are we actually going to get past this? Now there was so much space in between these two walls is that usually that space could often be a bit like the slum of the city where the poorer people might live in that space. Now, that was not a good space to live if there was a war, right? Because there's probably stuff coming over that first wall and you don't really want to be there uh, if not people, right? But that is often where uh, poorer people would live in that space just outside the first city wall. I think this stuff is is pretty interesting. Um, I geek out on it a little bit, right? So you're going to have to stay with me. So um, it seems that what took place here is that when the walls came tumbling down, you can see that if that first wall falls down, it's actually going to make a ramp below that for the people of Israel to actually run up into the city. Are you with me? Do you get that? So like God has a plan, right? He knows how these things work. Um, if, if you geek out a little bit like me and you want to read more about this, there is a great article on a website. It's called Answers in Genesis. Um, and it says that what we read in Scripture has now been confirmed by archaeology, which is no real amazing thing. Of course it has. But um, it's cool when you read this sort of stuff. So they have found the bricks of the wall that have fallen down 
Um, they have actually found the debris of where, uh, when, after Israel ran in, they burned the whole city. They have actually found all the debris from the fire of the city. When they went in, when archaeologists went in and excavated, they actually found these huge jars full of grain. And what had taken place at the time of Israelites coming to Jericho is that the harvest had just been collected by the people of Jericho and, and they put it in these, these big jars to store it up. And what's fascinating about this is that they would store the food just for general purpose, but also they would store up so much food is because um, often if an army would come to a place like Jericho, sometimes they would just surround the whole city and they would camp out for as long as it takes to starve the people inside the city walls. And so the people inside the city walls would stock up on food so that they could last a long time. And the interesting thing is in the situation, archaeologists have found the jars full of grain. And the reason is that this battle didn't take months or years. This battle took seven days. So they didn't even need to start eating their food reserves in that time. Is that cool? Is, it, does, is anyone else like, yeah, that's cool? Okay, okay. Because I've got more, all right? <laughs> So um, if, we, if we go back into Joshua chapter 2, it says that even before they crossed the land or crossed the river into the land, that Joshua sent out two spies to go and scope out the land. The spies ended up in the city of Jericho. They ended up staying with a lady named Rahab, who was a prostitute. And what happened was word got around the city that these two spies were there. And of course, the king doesn't like spies being in his city. So he sends people to find them. Rahab finds, uh, hides these two spies. When the time is right, Rahab lowers the two spies outside of the city walls, which was actually just dropping them outside of her window. So what we know of Rahab is that she lived, her house was actually built in to that outer wall of the city. Are you with me? So she drops the spies, the spies get away. Of course, they come back to Joshua. They tell him, man, everyone is freaking out that we are coming because they know that God is on our side. Now, what archaeology shows now is that when they've dug up this wall, there are parts of the wall that didn't fall down. And those parts are parts where there were actually houses built against the wall. And so what we see is that it's really, really likely, highly likely, that archaeologists have actually found the house that Rahab lived in. We know that the house was still standing because when the Israelites go into the city after the walls come down, Joshua says to his people, go and get Rahab because she'd made a deal with the spies that when they come in, that she would be saved and her family would be saved. So they go and get Rahab from her house and they keep her safe. Is that amazing? Isn't that cool? All right, can you imagine standing in Rahab's house? That would be cool. All right, here's where I'm going with this. There's something in this. Um, the record of this, God's amazing work at Jericho, only comes to demonstrate further that God is a supernatural, miracle-working God. This is what we have to get out of this, all right? Now, first of all, only God can cause the walls to tumble down with a trumpet blast and a shout from the men, right? Only God can do that. But then only God can do it in a way where Rahab's house doesn't fall down as well, literally being built into the wall. And here is the word, is that we need to continue living in this space and building our faith around the miraculous and the supernatural God that we live for. Because there are things that the Father wants to do that are far bigger than any of us can do in our own strength. And some of those things are daily. When you meet someone in a cafe who has a, a, a sore wrist or whatever it may be, and you think, God, we need you to heal this right now. There is nothing in your ability outside of God that you can do about that. But a supernatural God can come and say, I can heal that in the moment. And so we need to continue pressing into this space into this huge part of who God is. If we ignore this part of who God is, then we ignore a massive part of God, 
of, of God's identity, of who He actually is. He's the creator of the universe. He's the God who led Israel through the Red Sea on dry land. Then he led them through the desert. He supplied food for them. Miraculously, food from heaven came for them. He led them through the Jordan on dry land. He made the walls come tumbling down. This is the same God that you and I, that you and I live for. And the greatest miracle of all that we put our faith and trust in is that when we put our faith and trust in Him, we are saved. The work of the cross is sufficient for us. Now, if we can come and we can believe that, then we can come and believe in a supernatural, all-powerful God, a God who heals, a God who provides, a God who hears our audacious prayers and moves in that space. And this is a calling that God has for each one of us as followers of Jesus And if you read the Scriptures, if you open the Scriptures and see there is a difference in this God that I worship and I live for and this God that I read in the Scriptures, then it's time to make a change in our life, right? If you want to look at the life of Jesus and say, how did Jesus show me to live this kingdom life and there is a difference, then it's a time to make a change in our life. If you want to open the book of Acts and see what this looks like in practice, Have a look and see if there are changes that we need to make in our life. And we need to be calling on the Father to increase our faith in this space and release more and more. And why do we need it? All because we want to see more and more people reached with His love, His grace, His forgiveness, His power. It's all for His glory. It's not for our glory. It's all for His glory. And so this word that the Father has given us for Matthew 10 says, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. We are not going to do that without His help. Some guys in the Scriptures tried to do that and they got beaten up and sent away naked. That's a good read. (laughs) This is what the Father is calling us into. All right, so we've got Israel, this picture of this big journey that the Lord takes them on. He pulls them out of slavery and takes them into freedom. And then we have us and we're living in this life and the Father comes and He takes us from slavery into freedom. And they go into the desert and they come to the Jordan River and they go through the waters of the Jordan River heading into the promised land. And followers of Jesus are called to go through the waters of baptism as they step into the promised land. And what is the promised land? The promised land is the life that the Father has for each one of us. It's the now and the not yet. The life that is now, the kingdom that is now and it's coming as well. And it's not just reserved for heaven. You need to hear this. If it was reserved for heaven, you would get saved and taken in an instant, right? The kingdom is now. Jesus came and demonstrated. Read the book of Matthew and it's, you're just going to get overwhelmed with it. The kingdom is now. And so here's the thing, is that God leads us into the promised land, but there's enemies in the promised land. And the Father wants to see us overcome those enemies with His help, but it takes faith to actually do that. You know, it was by faith, the Scriptures say, that the Israelites marched around those walls. They didn't do it because it made sense. Like there were some dudes that were just itching to shoot some arrows, right? It was by faith. They said, well, if this, if this is what the Lord has said to Joshua and we've seen him do it before, then he can do it again. And we're going to march around these walls in faith. Hebrews records it. It says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. So faith is not knowing the future but knowing who holds the future, right? Faith is is believing without actually seeing something. And when you take faith and when you take obedience and you put them together, you find a beautiful thing. 
And so Joshua is given these commands from God and he does everything just as the Lord says. And it works. We see that through the obedience came the victory. And this is for someone this morning because a lack of obedience is preventing you from receiving what you hope for and what what God longs to give you. There's a lack of obedience that is preventing you from stepping into the fullness of the promised land that God has for you. And God is calling us into this place of obedience. But He's calling us from a place where He says, I want this to be your heart's desire, your first response. It's built in faith. So it's not something that we have logically worked out. Well, here's what God says. Uh, It all seems to make sense, so I'll be obedient to that. It's from a space of faith. I believe in what I can't see, but I'm going to be obedient in that space anyway. And for some people, this is a place that the Father is calling you into. It's a new level of obedience. It's a level of obedience that you've never lived in before. And it may just come purely from the Word that as you read the Scriptures and Holy Spirit starts to speak into your life and reveal that there is some distance between the way God's calling you to live and the way that you're living, that you're going to have a new level of obedience in that place before. I was talking to someone recently who was, who was sharing how when they came to faith, they started to read the Scriptures in this. One day they opened the Scriptures and they read something and they realised, oh my goodness, there is a part of my life that God does not want me to be living. And it was quite painful for them. It involved other people. And they had to make a decision in that point in time. Am I going to do what God says, what God wants me to do, or am I going to do what I want to do? And they said, well, I've chosen to put my faith and my trust in Jesus. This is the decision that I've made. And so I'm going to choose to put my faith and trust in Him with this situation as well. That as I do what He calls me to do, He's going to show me His goodness in that space. And this is a word that God is calling for each one of us. And I want to be specific this morning that it might be... um, This is the promised land that we're stepping into and there are enemies standing in front of us. And those enemies are going to be demolished with faith and obedience in the Father, okay? Now, some of us, those enemies are going to be sins like um, gossip and lust and pornography and um, other addictions and things like that. It might be an inappropriate relationship that's in your life. Um, It could be um, something like a drinking issue or something like that. Um, It's an enemy that is standing in front of you and the Father is calling you into the promised land, but it's standing in front of you and preventing you from going fully into all that God has for you. And this is going to be a season of seeing those enemies defeated with God's help. And I felt like as I was just preparing this part that God was saying to me that there's a word for someone in this room and the word is it's time to try again this time with me. That you've tried before and you've tried to take the promised land before but you've done it without God. And this time it's time to try again but with the Father's help. This word came to mind for me just when I was preparing this part. It comes from Titus 2. And it says, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us, grace is the Father's empowering presence. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. So for some people here, this year is going to be marked for you. By new level of obedience, I will do what the Father says to do. I'm going to get the team up and that's where I'm going to leave it for now. And we are just going to pray. What I'm going to get the team to do is we're just going to start worship seated. And um, you can just begin to worship. 
And prior to us getting everyone to stand, I want you to just be praying. And the response this morning is just that if you feel like God is saying something to you and you might know already, then just in this beginning part of worship, I just want you to stand. It's just a symbol of saying yes. Yes, Father. I'm going to do what you want me to do. New level of faith, new level of obedience. I'm going to take this promised land with your help. And so if Holy Spirit's just speaking something to you this morning, that's your response. Just prior to a to uh, Amy inviting everyone to stand as we get into this worship. It's just between you and God this morning. Thanks so much for listening to Hope Community Podcasts. We hope you enjoyed today's message and remember to subscribe to the channel to keep up to date. From everyone here at Hope Community, have the best week.